If you will, open up your Bibles, please, to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 5. So I don't know if you know, I want to know if anybody gets the title in this picture, so you have to tell me later. Uh, so you may not if you're not a Disney fan. But anyway, uh, Friday morning, Pat has the Vacaville police show up at her door. Seems that someone has used our church van to commit a robbery in Vacaville. So, praise the Lord that a reputation of a church held up with the police and they found out someone actually had stolen our license plate and put it on a similar white van to do the robbery. They had replaced the license plate with another one that was I guess stolen, I don't know. So we had not noticed that it was missing. Thank God that we did not get arrested or, or booked or whatever. I could just see it, you know, headlines, pastor arrested for using church van to rob a bank. I don't know what they robbed, but it uh, would have been wonderful. But we are free. We just got to go to DMV and get new license plates. We have, though, sinned. We have broken the law of God. But God has come along and justified us and said, I declare you free. Friday morning started off a little, little unnerving. What's going to happen? Our church van was used in a robbery? I knew it wasn't true. And I asked Pat, I said, okay, is this an April Fool's joke? Because it was on the 1st. Um, and when I was showing the officer my text with Pat, because she had sent me the case number when I called the Davis police, he noticed where I said, is this for real? Is this an April Fool's? He thought that was pretty funny. But it's no April Fool's joke that we deserve punishment for our disobedience to God. But Jesus found another way. Thank you, Lord. And that's what I want us to focus on this morning is that other way, that option. And we're going to read, and this is not the only place, where it says God does not remember our sins. That's the title. God is forgetful? That doesn't seem right, does it, for a God that is all-knowing. So what does that mean? So let's start in verse 5. It's going to be a little repetitive, and I will tell you why. It's quoting Psalms chapter 40, and then it's saying that Jesus fulfilled it. So that's why there's some repetition here. But starting in verse 5, Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. First, he said, sacrifices and offering, burnt offerings and sin offerings, you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, although the law required them to be made. Then he said, here am I. I have come to do your will. He set aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his re religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to make made his footstool because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them in their minds. Then, he adds, their sins 
and their lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sins. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this gift of forgiveness. We thank you for this gift of freedom. We thank you for this gift. this gift of life and love and inclusion. Help us to claim this gift and then proclaim it to the world. Amen. So what did God not like according to these verses? Yeah, he didn't like the sacrifices and offerings of the Old Testament rituals. Now, they're not wrong. He's not saying that, that they were not wrong that they were not right. They're required by the law, he says, the writer of Hebrews. So he says they're not against the law. They're not wrong to do them, but God is not satisfied. He doesn't desire them because they do not set us free from sin. They just remind us of how horrible sin is. They remind us that sin is costly. Where did the people get these animal sacrifices? Or the bread or the oil that they had to sacrifice and bring to the altars. Where did they get them? From the people themselves. Yeah, it cost them to bring these sacrifices. You think about a, a poor family having to bring a bull. That would have been extremely expensive. Some would just bring doves. But even that, they've got to buy, catch. It cost them something. That was the purpose is to help them remember when you sin, it costs. It is robbing you of your life and of your joy and God's intent. So it's not wrong, but God didn't desire them because it didn't set us free from sin. God wanted us to be free, not in a continual bondage and just pointing out, oh, you're in bondage. You better pay attention, you're in bondage. He came to set us free, to set us free. Recently, I watched the movie um, Harriet, about Harriet Tubman, who was remembered for leading a lot of slaves to freedom. She went first by herself because she was about to be sold and be separated from her husband, from her family. So she decided it was worth risking the dangers of getting caught and beaten and killed to escape to the north. But once she did, she couldn't be content with her freedom. And if you know anything of her story, I would encourage you to read about an amazing woman who, according to the movie, I, I'm sorry to say I've never read anything about her before, uh, but she depended upon God to direct her. And he would tell her, stop, and would send her in a different way to avoid being found by um, the soldiers and those that were out to capture her. Amazing, her dependence on God. But she never could be satisfied with her own freedom. She claimed it. She lived in that freedom. But she couldn't be satisfied. My friends, I bring that up because that's what God wants us. He can't be satisfied until we're all living in freedom. Amen. Harriet got that that sensation, that tendency from God, I think, because her fate seemed to be very real. And she would pray and she would seek God's guidance. And some people thought she was crazy. But she would hear from God and it would stop her in her tracks like she was in a trance. But it would be God speaking to her. Because God's desire was not one person be in bondage. Slavery broke God's heart it still breaks his heart. And we need to understand that. That's why he didn't like the sacrifices. They were commanded by the law, but they didn't set us free. And so Jesus, we see, says, here am I, send me. I'm here, I will volunteer. He wasn't forced to come down to earth. He volunteered for the job because like his father, he hates slavery. He hates seeing people in bondage. And so he came in body, that incarnation coming. But he says, I am here to do your will. That's the difference. 
We disobey God and we continue in bondage, but Jesus came and lived to do God's will. Remember that prayer in the garden? Not my will, but yours. He came and sacrificed through obedience. Look at 1 Samuel 15, 22. Samuel said, has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. What does God desire from us? Not that we come in and say, sorry, I sinned. And then we just go and do it again. That sacrifice meant nothing to God because it didn't set us free from continuing in that sin. He wants that obedience. That's his heart's desire. Because in that obedience, not only are we respecting and loving him, but we are free. So it's not that God is just this bossy, controlling God. It's that in obedience to him, we are free. Amen. Thank you, Wenzel. We are free. Anybody kind of like the idea of being free? But we're in bondage to sin. We're in bondage to the lies we've heard about ourselves, that we're not worthy, that we're, we're a failure, that God could never love us. Satan is full of lies to have us in bondage. And God wants us to be set free to know we're a child of his that are loved and desired. Look at Hosea 6.6, 6, same idea. God is speaking, for I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice and in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. I want you to know me and obey me. That's what blesses me because it blesses you. Again, Christianity has a bad label of, oh, we're about don't, 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 don't. We have all this list of don'ts. Well, let me sum it up this way. Don't be in bondage. That's really the message. But Satan has twisted it of, oh, don't have fun, don't have options, don't have a life. And the message of God is don't be in bondage. And here are those things that put you in bondage. I want you to be free. I want you to enjoy life. I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Because when I'm in bondage to sin, I don't feel very loved. I might feel that I'm my own boss and I'm getting to choose what I want to do. And so like some kid or teenager, you can't tell me what to do. But many times the results is not a lot of fun. I don't feel very loved. But when I'm obeying God, I'm in fellowship with him. I know I'm cherished. Amen. Amen. That's what this message is about. Christianity is not about don't, 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 don't. It's about don't be in bondage. Be free. Be free to be loved and accepted. So what made Jesus the better sacrifice than all these animals? One time, but what made him able to do it one time? He was sinless. Yeah, you're right, and I'm going to emphasize that in just a minute. One time, and it was done. One and done. But yeah, Jesus fulfilled this prophecy that we're reading from Psalms 40. He came incarnate, but he was perfectly obedient to God. And that's what God desired. God didn't desire thousands of animals sacrificed on an altar. He desired obedience. So Jesus came and sacrificed a life of obedience to God, obedience even to death. So Jesus was the perfect sacrifice because he was what God desires. So it wasn't just that he had no sin in his life. We focus on that. Jesus was sinless. So he was like that spotless lamb. No, it's so much more than just he was sinless. He was obedient to God. And that's what God desires. Not a sacrifice, but obedience. So it says then in verse 9 that Jesus replaced the first with the second, the first was those animal sacrifices to remind us that sin caused, that we're in bondage. But he replaced it with the second, which was the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And it was finished once and for all. So what did Jesus accomplish? Now we'll come back to what Jan said. What did Jesus accomplish? Look at 1 Peter 3, 18 again. 
Peter 3.18. For Christ also died for sins once. He didn't have to keep doing it again and again and again and again. One time and done because he was the perfect sacrifice. The priest had to keep sacrificing again and again and again. Daily, they are in the temple standing because there's no end. Can you imagine a line of people that had sinned bringing all of their animals to be sacrificed, bringing the, the pigeons, bringing their, their cakes of bread to be sacrificed for all their sins, for their thank offerings? Uh, so their job was never finished, but once and done for all. Is there anyone God will not forgive? No. no. I don't care what uh, dirty little secret you're carrying around with you, what skeleton is in your closet. Jesus knows it, and he's already said it's forgiven. I love you. He's not looking for that perfect life. He's looking for a life that is submitted in obedience now, but to accept his love and forgiveness, his freedom. Once for all, the just being Jesus for the unjust, us, so that we, he might bring us to God. So we might be in relationship with him. Harriet, yeah, Harriet's purpose was to bring the slaves to slavery where they were respected as individual children of God that had been created in the image of God that had the same rights of any other person. That's God. He says, I want you to know freedom. I want you to know you're a loved child of God. So Jesus died to forgive us of our sins, to set us free, to bring us to God, to be adopted as his children, having put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Some religions have difficulty that if Jesus is God, how could he die? But he died in body, but not in spirit. He was still alive and active for who he is, but his body died. Is that punishment for our sins? Move on to Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Therefore, since the children share in the flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same. So he came to be like us in flesh and blood, that through the death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Jesus defeated our enemy. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. We have nothing to fear. Satan has no power other than his tongue <laughs> that he uses to lie. But if we don't listen to those lies, he has no power. He's defeated. He is a prisoner behind bars that can't get out and touch us, but he can get in our mind and scare us and deceive us. So how do we defeat him? We just, yeah, just turn him off. Don't listen. Many of you remember Chase's expression. Um, for those that don't know Chase, he is deaf. And so when I would be telling him something to do, he would go, I'm blind, I can't hear you. I'm blind, I can't hear you. And he would just close his eyes, and he was right. He couldn't hear me. I could be signing all I wanted to. And he didn't know what I was saying. We need to just tell Satan, I'm blind, I can't hear you. I'm choosing not to listen. It's that simple. Verse 15, that he might... Free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. That he might free us from that slavery. That's why he came to die. Not just to forgive us of our sins. We know that. We embrace that. But we stay in sin. We stay in slavery. And he set us free. One of Harriet's sisters chose to stay. She was too scared to escape. And she chose to stay. Harriet came and begged her, come with me to freedom. And she was too frightened. That whole idea of the risk and what might be involved. And she chose to stay in slavery. 
And we might look at that and go, how could anyone choose to stay in slavery and experience the abuse she did? But we do it every day, my friends. We choose to stay in slavery to sin because we don't embrace the freedom that God bought for us with his son's death. Continue in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 23 and to 27. The former priest, on the uh, one hand, existed in great numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. So the former priest of the Old Testament, they died. So they had to be replaced and there had to be many of them. But Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus is praying for us. He is defending us. And he is able to save us forever. He's able to set us free forever. Continue verse 26. For it is fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, because this he did once and done for all when he offered up himself. Yeah, thank you. We ought to be some smiles here. Are are you with me? It's done. It's finished. We have been set free. There is no more bondage unless we volunteer for it. There is no more bondage. Jesus completed everything that was needed for our freedom and our ability to enter into the presence of God and experience love and acceptance. So why do we continue in disobedience? So what did Jesus accomplish? What the old sacrificial system could not. He made us, according to verse 10, holy. He made us holy, set apart to God, cleansed. His sacrifice was effective for all time, forever, for all people. And his sacrifice was complete. There's no need for anything else to be done. Paid in full. Your debt is finished. Ever been buying a car on on monthly payments? And you get that last one, paid in full. And it comes with a title and you now own your car. If you're like me, you've been paying on it so long, it's time for a new one by that time. But it's exciting to be free of those payments. To owe nothing. And to know, this is my car, not the banks anymore. And I owe nothing else. That's the idea. Jesus said, you owe nada. Zilch. Because I paid it in full. My sacrifice was only needed to be once Because it wasn't just a little payment towards sins and a reminder that sin is bad. I conquered the father of the lies. I conquered death. And I did it one time for all eternity for every man, woman, boy, and girl alive who would come near to me, who would accept me as their Savior. Amen. So now let's look at Acts chapter 13. Oops, I skipped it. Sorry, that was the problem, wasn't it, Todd? Sorry. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through him forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and through him everyone who believes, so we do have to take some action, trusting him, is freed from all things from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. 
The law could not free you. It reminded you of your sin. But through the blood of Jesus Christ, you have been forgiven of everything. Your wildest imagination, your worst sin. Jesus looks at it and says, you're forgiven. I paid for that too. If we hold on to that guilt, if we hold on to that feeling that we need to punish ourselves, we're saying to God, you aren't enough. You aren't enough. I need to help you out by being punished some for that sin. No. Nothing you have done in your past, no matter what anybody may have told you, no matter what kind of shame you're carrying around for it, God says, I paid for that. You're forgiven. You are forgiven. So what do Christians have? The proof of this blood, the proof of this freedom. We have the Holy Spirit, we are told, in verse 15, who puts God's laws in our heart and our mind. So where before we might have obeyed out of fear of getting caught. Yesterday, I, I kind of missed the time and was running a little late to pick up Emily and I jump in the car and I'm headed out to get her and almost immediately behind me, two police officers going up pole line. I turn left on Covell, they turn left on Covell. They follow me all the way almost to Todd and Barbara's house. So normally, I know the law. If you get through a light before it turns red, if you get across that line, it's supposed to be legal. You're not going through the ground. But when I saw it yellow way back, I didn't gun it like normally. I slowed in and stopped. I drove 25 on Poland and 35 on Covell. So I was really late picking up Emily because I, I, I had somebody watching. If they had not been there, Let's just say Emily wouldn't have had to wait as long for me. <laughs> but here, I would obey out of my love for God. The Holy Spirit puts it in my heart and in my mind so I understand what God wants of me and I desire to do it. So it's not a forced can't, 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 don't, don't, don't. It's I love you and I want to do this to honor you and the gift you have given me of freedom. So what does God promise us in verse 17 and 18? Our sins he will remember no more. So this is where I have that question at the beginning. So is God forgetful? He says, I will remember your sins no more. I grew up having people tell me, well, if you go to God and say, God, would you forgive me of this sin? He goes, what sin? It's like God has dementia. Hmm. Because if you remember, the Bible tells us we've got to stand before God and give an account of every deed, of every word that's spoken, every uh, careless word spoken. So is God really forgetful? So what does he mean? Some time back, I finally arrived at what I would say would be truly forgiving somebody that had wronged me. And now you can mention that person's name. There's no effect emotionally. I don't get stressed. But last year, I found some of the papers that I had saved to prove they had wronged me. So if I ever needed it, I could support my case. Because, quote unquote, as a judge would say, hearsay doesn't support anything legally. You can say, well, I heard this. Well, they can say no and so they don't accept hearsay. They need proof. So something in writing. And I had lots of papers, lots of emails I had printed off. And I shredded them one by one. Now, I will confess, I could still remember some of those wrongs if you asked me. And right now, some are popping back up. But what I did is I forgot them in the fact that I've given up now any evidence I had that would support my case to try to seek punishment for that wrong. And as I was studying this week, that was the image, the, the memory that came back to me is that's what God has done. He's put aside any right to confront you with your sin and saying you're wrong, you're a failure. He's not interested in that. God is all-knowing. So it's not that he goes, duh, 
I don't know anything about you other than your name and you're saved. That list of sins just kind of disappeared. And I see you as perfect. No. He knows what we did was wrong. He knows we're a failure and a sinner. But my friends, he still loves you. Amen. He still desires you, fellowship. Now that's not where I am yet. I have no desire of fellowship with this person. But I have no anger anymore. No desire to seek punishment. But God's heart is much better. Because oh, yeah. he does remember your sin. But he's chosen to not have it on his forefront. He has chosen to forget it, to put it aside. It's not important to him. What's important to him is that fellowship with him. So he's looking at you as a cherished child. So what did God promise? I will not remember your sins. You are forgiven. And then he says, and there's no need for any other sacrifice. You don't have to do anything to pay for your sin and your wrong. No matter how bad your past is, no matter how other people may judge you and look down upon you, God looks at you as his cherished child. And all he's interested in is you walking in obedience so you're walking in freedom. And you can know and experience his love. Look at 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. No more needs to be done. There is no need for any more sacrifice from Jesus or us or anyone else. No one else needs to pay the punishment because it's done. It's paid in full. So what are you going to do with this promise? Are you going to be like Harriet's brothers who join her on the Underground Railroad and go to freedom? Or are you going to be like her sister who's too afraid and stays in the known, stays in the bondage? Because even though it was bad, and even though her, and I even have a hard time because this is just unfathomable, but this would be what they were called back then. Her master sold her baby as punishment for her disobedience, separated her from her little child. She still chose to stay in that bondage out of fear. Will you accept this gift of freedom? Will you stand up and say, God's design is not for any man, woman, boy, or girl to be in bondage. Whether it is physical slavery here on this earth or spiritual slavery, that is not his design for anyone. And he has bought our freedom. And we have a Harriet Tubman, and his name is Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit that will guide us to, that, to live in that freedom. So will you claim this gift of freedom today? Will you claim the fact, stop beating yourself up, stop walking around in guilt and shame and say, I am free. And then will you let others know? Can you be a spiritual Harriet that risk your lives knowing that some will hate you for it, some will reject your help? But there were others. She would be met along, met along the way with people she didn't even know. And her nickname, I thought was fun, was Moses because she was delivering her people. But she would welcome, even though it made it more difficult, made it harder to hide when the group got larger. Anybody that said they wanted to join her, she welcomed them. My friends, I don't have to tell you our world is deteriorating quickly. And I don't know if Jesus is coming back soon or he wants a revival and he's going to postpone his coming. But I know we need to live like he's not coming for a long time and we need to be prepared like he's coming right now. Amen. We need to be sharing this good news and not be ashamed of it, but ready.
to take that risk because there are still people alive today that want to know they're set free, that need to know they're loved and forgiven because they're carrying around a lot of guilt. They're carrying a lot of shame. And too many are trying to find an answer by suicide, trying to find an answer by drugs or bad relationships, looking for somebody, just crying out for somebody to give me attention and love. And they're accepting, like Harriet's sister, that abuse. And we've got the freedom to give them to know you are valued. You deserve to live like a child of the king. And we want to tell you how. Heavenly Father, Please forgive me when I live like Harriet's sister and choose to stay in bondage and areas of my life. Help me, Father, to stop that, to accept your freedom in every area of my life. And to live in that freedom. To experience the joy of being set free and no longer in bondage to sin and Satan. But alive to be loved and accepted and led by you. May I experience the full joy of the gift of life that you bought for me. And then help us, Father to go and to proclaim that good news to everyone we meet, to let them know you've been set free. You are loved and cherished. Amen. If you do not know the Lord as your Savior, we want to invite you to come as we stand to sing. Let me pair it with somebody that would be happy to guide you in knowing how to invite him into your heart, to live into that freedom. Most of us have already accepted him as our Savior, but maybe we're still living in bondage. If you want somebody to pray with you, that you can accept that freedom, you can step out, even though it may sound a little scary. You may think you still need to pay something for your sin. Come and let us pray with you to help you begin that journey of experiencing that freedom. So as God leads you and you want somebody to pray with you, whatever your need, would you come to the front as we stand and sing together, I have decided to follow Jesus.